And Zal Khalilzad, I have the honor of uh, moderating this uh, session. Uh, uh, the session is on the decision to withdraw from the nuclear agreement with Iran. If you are uh, not here to listen to a panel discussion on that, you are in the wrong place. Uh, so welcome to all of you. I see many distinguished uh, friends and colleagues uh, here, including the Russian ambassador. Welcome. Uh, and uh, we will start with... Of course, sorry, Ambassador, welcome. Yeah. Um, we'll start with Peter Pillar. You we all know Paul. Uh, he has uh, been a senior official in our intelligence community, but again, I'm high up from the Middle East. And uh, he's a contributor, at it, editorial contributor. He writes frequently in the national interest. I know I read it. Uh, his writings are always insightful. And he also has had an affiliation with Georgetown. Uh, so, delighted to have you here, Paul. And look forward to hearing from you. And after Paul, we have Zach Lyman, a very distinguished um, colleague uh, for many years, uh, former Under Secretary of Defense, Vice Chair of our board here at the National Interest, and uh, a frequent contributor on uh, a lot of different issues. So, uh, look forward to your views now. So, Paul. Over to you. Thank you very much, Zal, and thank you all for coming. Uh, some of the consequences of the Trump administration uh, reneging on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, aka the Nuclear Deal, uh, are fairly certain, uh, but others are uncertain and depend on political and economic developments uh, yet to play out and which would be hard for any of us to predict. Let me start with the JCPOA itself. Before the negotiations for that agreement began, uh, the Iranian leadership had evidently made the decision that to uh, take meaningful steps toward full political and economic reintegration into the world community and everything that applies in terms of the economic benefits and getting away from pariahdom was worth uh, accepting uh, substantial restrictions on the nuclear program, uh, and certainly accepting uh, closing any path toward a nuclear weapon. Well, today the basic issue um, is whether Iran, as it now is entitled to do, given the Trump administration's reneging on the accord, consider itself free of any of the obligations that it assumed in JCPOA, and to simply brush them aside as easily as the Trump administration brushed aside its obligations. The Iranian leadership seems to have decided that it was it will explore as thoroughly as it can with the other five remaining parties to the agreement how to keep some version of the JCPOA minus the United States alive. So far, it's an exploration of possibilities. Uh, it has not been determined uh, you know, whether those possibilities will be substantial enough uh, for the agreement uh, still to live. And I'm sure the Iranian leaders have not yet made what will be their key decisions as to whether indeed uh, there is grounds for them to say there's, there's still an agreement. The underlying substantive question is whether the economic benefits to Iran of commerce and investment with the rest of the world will be sufficient, not only without U.S. positive participation, but in the face of the Trump administration's active attacking of anyone else uh, engaging in commerce and investment with Iran. Um, and that question, in turn, is going to depend very heavily on decisions in the private sector, especially the European private sector. Now, there are several reasons one could argue why the possibilities will be enough and then we still have, will have an agreement minus the United States. Uh, Iran's economic relations with Europe and with Russia and China are far greater than the, anything they've had in recent years with the United States. Uh, and the European governments and the European Union as a whole, as, as represented by Foreign Affairs Chief Mogherini, uh, seem determined to try to make this work. And they have a number of reasons for this. Uh, they realize, they accept that the JCPOA is a worthwhile agreement. It has served a useful purpose in closing all paths toward a nuclear weapon. 
for a country that might otherwise have wanted to uh, attain one. Um, and it's been working, as, as certified by the IAEA that Iran has lived up to its obligations. Uh, the Europeans are also, you know, at least, have at least as great a stake as the United States does, or the other parties do, in the extent of turmoil and, uh, and unrest in the Middle East, since they've been directly affected through such things, particularly as, as the flow of migrants. And I think this particular disagreement with the United States uh, has passed a threshold in terms of degree of animosity and mistrust. I think the Europeans, with, with good reason, have been seeing uh, the Trump administration as having bargained in bad faith in that they talked about you know, new deals, further supplements, and so on. But really, Donald Trump is going to do all along what he did last week. Uh, and that represents bad faith. And besides, of course, the, their economic interests of their own in terms of uh, investments and marketing. You, know, um, you factor in, besides the Europeans, uh, Russia and China, then the possibilities for uh, doing things economically and financially that perhaps haven't been done so far but could keep the deal alive and expand. I'd certainly be very interested to hear if uh, Ambassador Antonov has anything to say on that from a Russian point of view, as far as the Chinese are concerned. Um, it will be interesting to watch whether, uh, say, some of the large Chinese banks uh, expand their role in a way that would help the Europeans and others do an end around the you know, U.S. financial system and everything that the Treasury is, is, uh, Department is slapping on people that want to uh, have financial ties still with the United States. And of course the Chinese would be better equipped than any of the other parties to do things like create separate business entities so different ones are dealing with the United States and with Iran and that would get around um, uh, some of the problem with secondary sanctions. Which leads to all the reasons in the other direction. Why one might argue that this isn't going to work. And the deal will be all uh, killed. And the main one by far is the ability of the U.S. Treasury Department to impose secondary sanctions, um, uh, of which we've already seen you know, them in action for, for some time. Uh, already, before the action last week, what had been the Trump administration's cheating on the deal, uh, such as you know, actively discouraging at a G20 meeting uh, Congress with Iran, which explicitly violates one of the terms of the agreement, there's already been a lot of discouragement uh, of commerce and investment uh, with Iran. And although the European governments uh, have, have talked a lot and they're certainly actively exploring now you know, so-called blocking measures, things that would um, try to counteract what the U.S. Treasury would do, there's only so much they can do. When you're talking about, in the case of major firms that have business uh, interests in the United States that they don't want to have jeopardized, or financial ties with the U.S. banking system they, they don't want to have messed up. Uh, they have obvious reasons um, in doing the best by their shareholders to, um, to not go under to what the Treasury says, uh, they should, the U.S. Treasury says they should do, whereas the U.S. Uh, ambassador of Germany explicitly was instructing them to do. If I were to lay odds right now as to whether, say, one year from now we're going to have some version of the JCPOA, you know, minus the U.S. in effect, I'd say it's somewhere around one chance in three that we will and two chances out of three that we won't. That's just sort of my rough stab at uh, where we stand right now. The least bad outcome uh, for U.S. interests and for the interests of regional peace and security would be if such a version of the JCPOA does survive. But uh, the outcome is still pretty bad. Uh, you'd still have a bunch of the negative consequences I'm about to allude to in a moment. And in one of these negative areas, namely the poisoning or further poisoning of U.S.-European relations, things could get even worse because it, 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 as long as the Trump administration pursues its current course, because you're talking about nothing less than economic warfare, not just against Iran, but it would be against the Europeans uh, insofar as they are in this resistance mode. If Tehran were to decide, uh, after exploring the possibilities, to decide, as is its right, given the reneging by the U.S., that the JCPOA is null and void and that it uh, is no longer subject to uh, the restrictions and obligations it imposed when it uh, agreed to the accord, 
Uh, then there would be all of the negative consequences in addition that are associated with Iran being released from all of its nuclear obligations under that agreement. It would mean Iran would be free again to enrich as much uranium as it wants, as fast as it wants, to as high a level as it wants. It would be free to pursue the plutonium route as well, uh, build a new reactor or somehow take the concrete out of the one that was uh, disabled. <laughs> Uh, and, and so we'd be back where we were uh, more than two years ago with all of the uh, you know, scary possibilities being discussed about how short the breakout time would be uh, uh, to Iran getting the bomb. And just to refresh your memory, you know, before uh, the JCPOA and the earlier preliminary agreement, the JPOA came into agreement, you know, by some estimates, the so-called breakout time, if Iran really wanted to sprint to a bomb, was getting as low as, you know, two or three months. With everything that the JCPOA imposed, in terms of the obligations to get rid of 95% of its enriched uranium, three-fourths of its centrifuges, uh, you know, disabling the reactor, all that sort of stuff, it, it, it increased it to by at least a year. Um, so we'd be back into that old situation we were, and just remember how, how the debate went about the Iran nuclear threat back then. Well, that's where we would be. Um, Iran probably, if, if this is their decision, would not rush into uh, spending as many centrifuges as they could, as fast as they could. I mean, they, they are right now on the high road in terms of being the party that has met its obligations, as distinct from the Trump administration, which has reneged on its. And I don't, I don't think also it would want to do things precipitously in a way that would encourage the, the consensual worldwide discussion of being, oh, it's racing for a bomb. You know, whether or not it was racing for a bomb, uh, whether, whether or not it actually was. The comprehensive inspections, uh, in my view, you know, at least as important a provision of the JCPOA as all the actual restrictions, uh, could go as well. Uh, Iran, uh, if it says no more JCPOA, then it would only have the far more cursory inspections uh, to which it was subject as a party to the non-proliferation treaty. It still would be a party to the NPT unless it decided to withdraw from that, and its, it's policy is good. No, we're going to maintain it. Although it should be noted that you know, what had been just some voices on the Iranian fringe about maybe we ought to get out of the NPT regime and really talk seriously about weapons and not just peaceful nuclear programs, that has become, that talk one hears uh, more now, given what the Trump administration has done, and it's uh, more than just uh, chatter of the fringe. Now, briefly, have some of the other consequences of the decision that was implemented last week, going beyond the JCPOA itself, and mostly not dependent on whether or not the agreement ultimately lives or dies. It already, the move already is encouraging a further turn to hardline politics inside Iran. Uh, pragmatists, including President Rouhani, and specifically, and in particular, Rouhani, who really went out on a limb with regard to his commitment to this agreement and to negotiate it, have been severely embarrassed and politically weakened. Uh, the hardliners uh, quite readily are saying, we told you so. Uh, it was a mistake ever to put any trust in the United States and to reach agreements with them. The Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, generally counted among the hardliners, had sort of covered himself in advance because his position throughout the negotiations was giving enough support to Rouhani to, to see if a deal could be reached, but constantly saying and constantly expressing distrust uh, and putting himself in a position to be able to say, too, now, I told you so, and that we were really uh, taking a chance by trying to, to trust those Americans. The increased uh, political sway of the miners has implications far beyond nuclear policy. It means anything else you want to talk about with regard to foreign and security policy, Iranian regional activities, and so on, will be more in line with the preferences uh, and the risk-taking propensities that we would associate with the hardliners more so than with the practices. The, uh, the move effectively kills, for the time being, any chance for a negotiated agreement, a new negotiated agreement with Iran 
in the United States on just about anything, uh, be it nuclear matters or anything else. Uh, U.S. credibility is, to put it mildly, in the tank uh, in Tehran right now. Remember that the Iranians were the ones who scrupulously observed their, their obligations and now they're still being hit with what they would be hit with or supposed to be hit with if they didn't observe their obligations. One of the tragic ironies of all this is that much of that rhetoric we've heard for months and months um, by opponents of the JCPOA about sunset provisions, missiles, nefarious regional activity and all that sort of stuff there is now less chance for any agreements that might address any of those things than there was before the reneging of the JCPOA. As for the notion that we just need more pressure on Iran to somehow get the Iranians to cry uncle and make concessions on these or any other matters, that notion overlooks, I think, several things. One is the JCPOA itself was exhaustively negotiated. This was an extremely long and difficult negotiation. Um, you know, athletes talk about you know, leaving it all on the field. You know, they, you know, they put every bit of energy they possibly could into it to try to get a win. The negotiators of all the parties, the JCPOA, left it all on the negotiating table. You know, there was not a better deal to be had. And that was even back when you had more of a unity of effort with regard to sanctions and pressure in Iran which we don't have now. So if, if you're talking about the Trump administration trying to come up with some new deal, it is no longer with the support and cooperation of the other five parties, non-Iranian parties, the JCPOA, all of whom are very much opposed to what the administration just did. Um, there's some other factors that the notion overlooks. The Iranians really know how to take punishment. I always look at the Iran-Iraq war, you know, the terrible eight-year ordeal in which that regime, you know, and, and its population withstood enormous sacrifice economically in terms of personal and physical harm. Um, and, and it wasn't until uh, well after the military tide had, had actually turned and Saddam Hussein was willing to make a peace that finally the Iranians agreed uh, to a truce. The internal Iranian politics, the turn to the hardliners I mentioned before, um, also works against any new agreements. Finally, I would say that uh, the risk of a military clash that somehow involves the United States and Iran is greater today, well, than it was eight days ago, but I would say you know, greater than it was a year and a half ago. And I readily admit it's hard to disentangle what may be effects related to the JCPOA and, and the move last week from the larger directions of the Trump administration, and they really are kind of woven together. But, but there, there are several things that underlie my statement that I think the risk is higher. The possibility of a new nuclear scare, which I alluded to earlier, if the Iranians say, look, uh, the, the agreement is null and void. The harder line in Iranian policy, policies, and which means greater um, possibilities for clashes and incidents that could escalate out of control. Uh, the absence of a communication channel, which was very effectively established, uh, you know, under the previous administration at the foreign minister level, when you had Zarif and Kerry talking about a lot of things, and, and the payoff really came when we had that incident a couple of years ago. You recall when uh, U.S. naval craft strayed into Iranian territorial waters and our sailors were, for a few hours, held in captivity by the Iranians. And the foreign minister channel, and that, that communication line, was absolutely critical in quickly defusing that situation, getting our craft and our sailors back. I, I shudder to think uh, how such an incident would play out now uh, without such a channel. And finally, uh, I think there's been an emboldening of those other regimes and governments in the in the region on whose side the Trump administration has unreservedly thrown itself and with the reneging on the JCPOA being part of that side take. And I'm of course talking about Saudi Arabia, I'm also talking about Israel. And we have in the latter case uh, things really going in the Netanyahu government's way. We had all the hoopla yesterday of course uh, at, at the embassy, 
we've had this decision on JCPOA, which is something that that government had wanted a long time, and they even won the Eurovision Song Contest. Just <laughs> um, you know, I, it, it's hard to make specific connections, but look at what has happened you know, over the Syrian border right, over the last week or so. I mean, the Israelis, again, we can't attribute all this just to you know, changes of the last week because the Israelis have been launching scores and scores of airstrikes in Syria. But it was finally last week, through, whether you want to interpret the combination of the Israelis cranking up their escalation one more or two more notches in order to finally get, provoke a, a reaction, and or the Iranians uh, changing their calculations a bit and seeing with the reneging of the deal they basically got less to lose, they're willing to take care of this. Well, you saw what happened last, last week. And, but even then there was the, you know, the, the reaction, if it was the Iranians and not the Syrians, was relatively mild hitting uh, um, Israeli military targets, not in Israel proper, but uh, on the Golan Heights. So, uh, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, that's, uh, that's how it plays right now. And, uh, I don't think it looks very good. Thank you. Yep. Well, I guess uh, I'm expecting to rebut all of that. Um, I will up to a point. Let me start by saying I don't agree with Mr. Trump that this is the worst deal that's ever been made. I can think of the kellogg Briand Pact, which eliminated war sometime before World War II. So um, I think it was a bad deal. Uh, the sunset provisions were much too short. A country that deals in terms of culture, that deals in terms of centuries, is not going to worry too much about 10 or 15 or 25 years. There was no provision for missiles. Um, I don't think, by the way, that it would have had any provision for reducing turmoil in the region, um, but there should have been inspections of, facility, of military facilities. And it's all very nice for the IAEA to say, well, we've had 10 reports and they've complied. Of course they've complied if they're doing stuff in their military facilities, just as, for example, North Korea is. And frankly, Mr. Obama should have gone to the Hill, which would have made it a lot harder for Mr. Trump to walk away from. Um, having said that, uh, I tend to agree with a lot of what Paul has just said. Um, Mr. Trump was playing to his base. He likes to be seen as a promise keeper. He makes all kinds of promises, whether it's to uh, you know cut taxes and spend more at the same time, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Grover could perhaps address that a little bit. Um, uh, he and, and this was a promise. This was one of those promises made in front of the stadia in Alabama and Mississippi. I'm going to walk away from this deal. Uh, that's not necessarily how you actually run a government or deal with international relations, but that seems to be what he's done. Now, I don't think we should have left it, in spite of the critique that I just made, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, uh, this is not the first time that we've broken our word in the last decade. Uh, ask Mr. Gaddafi what it's like cut a deal with him, and then you support his being killed. And uh, we want to cut a deal with Korea. If I were Kim Jong-un, I would ask myself, why? What am I going to get out of it? Do I want to get killed by an angry mob? So uh, he's kind of, I think the president's kind of shot himself in the foot. In a way, he thinks he'll get a peace prize. God willing, maybe he will, and maybe there'll be peace. But I'm not convinced. Um, what I think he should have been done, and I'll get back to it, but just we're passing right now, say he should have picked up on Macron's advice. I'll get back to that. What he can do now to avert the uh, probability that Paul gives of two thirds of this thing just going haywire perhaps reversing it and saying two-thirds, 65%, 66% chance that this thing can be saved, is he can do what he's doing on tariffs, which is to say, first he imposes them, and then he kind of moderates them, lifts them, cuts deals about them. Um, the mark seems to be much greater than the bite every single time. And so if he did the same thing with secondary sanctions, for example, or at least as Al was whispering to me just before we started, 
to say I'm delaying secondary sanctions six months. And I'll delay it another six months. She kind of was doing for Paris, by the way. Um, that gives everybody a little more breathing room. It allows the Iranians to, at least it allows actually the president to turn around to the crazies and say, well, wait a minute, this thing might still work. He hasn't done what he fully said he would do. It allows the Europeans, who really do want to expand the deal, precisely for the reasons that I mentioned, it's not that they think the deal was bad. They thought the deal was good. But they are concerned about what Iran is doing in the Middle East. They are concerned about inspections. They are concerned about sunset provisions. And, sorry? And missiles. And missiles, of course. And so they'd like to expand it. Now, Iran has said no, but the Iranians didn't invent, invent chess for nothing. Who says yes at the beginning of a negotiation, other than the Brits who say yes, but? And then they negotiate you down. Everybody else says no, and then you negotiate. And so the fact that Iran has up front said no when in fact nothing's been offered, I don't see that as, as a deal breaker. But that's what Mr. Trump has to do. If he doesn't do that, and if he imposes secondary sanctions, there will be a consequence that Paul did not mention, which is NATO is in deep trouble. I wouldn't say it's going to fall apart, but it's in very deep trouble. Go and ask the French to join you in an attack on Syria when you have just wrecked Mr. Macron's hope for an improved economy. Go and ask the Germans to spend more on defense when you have just wrecked their economy. I mean, the European economies, even the German one, are not as solid as ours, which means that if you impose these secondary sanctions, you're creating a terrible dilemma for these folks. They may resist, in which case we've got a problem inside NATO. They may not resist, in which case we have a problem inside NATO. So that the consequences really are very, very serious indeed. Now, uh, I don't think that extending a breakout from three months to 12 months is that big a deal. That's not the point anymore. Any more, by the way, than the issue was, despite what Mr. Netanyahu did with his televised press conferences and everything else, that the issue was Israeli, uh, was Iranian att uh, nuclear attacks on Israel. I don't think that was ever the issue. By the way, Ehud Barak has just said that. And I remember arguing with Ehud when he, when he was defense minister that that was already the case. And the reason is very simple. Look at the layers of Israeli defenses and run the probabilities of a missile actually getting through, or even five missiles getting through. They are tiny. Now, I'm sure the Iranians believe what everybody else in the world believes, that the Israelis have a nuclear case, second strike, or at least first strike capability. Well, if you're even a Republican Guard general, are you going to advise the Ayatollahs to commit suicide? Because the Israelis have a 100% chance of getting through. And the last time I checked, even during the Iran-Iraq war, the Ayatollahs never tried to commit suicide. They sent somebody else, but not themselves. The issue for Israel is, and was, and, and what isn't just a consequence of uh, what happened last week, they don't want Iran having a presence in Syria. Why? Very simple. Everybody seems to conveniently ignore the fact that the Iranians, A, say they want to destroy the Jewish state, and B, other than the Jews in their own country, they don't mind killing Jews anywhere else. Like, for example, in Argentina. C, they support Hamas, which has the same objective and is much more open about it. Why do they support Hezbollah? Why does Hezbollah need 150,000 missiles? Or 100,000 rockets, or whatever number you want to pick. Six figures for sure. So, the tension in Syria really has much less to do with this deal than I think people on either side of the argument are making. What really counts is whether you can walk the cat back. Now, we have precedents for cats walking back. We don't remember them all. In 1954, there was a proposal for the European defense community. They had had a European coal and steel community at that point, and they wanted to have the United Europe, frankly, against the Soviets. 
It lost in the French Assembly by one vote. And everybody said the sky was falling. You could never have European cooperation on defense. It's not going to happen. Within a year, they created Western European Union, which eventually got absorbed into NATO. People do reverse themselves. As I said, even Mr. Trump reverses himself, sometimes within the space of 24 hours. Look what he did on ZTE, to the point where his own Treasury Department, run by his good friend, has no understanding as to why he just did that. So Mr. Trump can reverse him. And look, he's sitting down with a little rocket man after. I don't think anything Mr. Trump says is fine. Nothing. And I don't think the Iranians believe that it's fine. I don't think the Europeans believe it's fine. So what has to be done, essentially, is to buy time for Macron and the other Europeans to do two things. One, cut their deal with the Iranians so that the essentials of the JCPOA are preserved. Secondly, convince Mr. Trump not to impose secondary sanctions because it will blow up in his face. And third, convince Mr. Trump by not imposing secondary sanctions to open the door for them to lead the negotiation to expand this deal and to work the cat back. Is it doable? I believe it is. Is it only one third? Hopefully it's more than that. And in a sense, I'm standing on its head what everybody says about Mr. Trump. It's precisely because he's not consistent that I think we have hope. Thank you. <coughs> Paula, I want to ask you uh, to comment on what uh, David outlined as a possible way <coughs> it could evolve, perhaps even to a better physical situation than we were. Uh, inside the agreement. Um, when you do that, if you would, uh, as you do that, if you would take into account the reports that one reads in the published uh, media about the domestic situation, you, you made a comment that there's a shift towards uh, hardliners. But when we said the economic situation is, uh, is quite bad, and, uh, that the lira has lost uh, 3% of its value, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, the um, uh, several financial institutions have collapsed. People's savings have been destroyed. There's capital flight. Uh, that uh, tensions uh, in the country are on the rise. Uh, increased unemployment. Um, moderates are losing ground. Yes, maybe some to hardliners, but others to sort of saying there should be change, if not of regime, but change in regime, so to speak. Uh, and that, uh, uh, what impact will that have? And also if you would comment on, on one other point, uh, that I think the option of cheating a little bit or getting out of the agreement a little bit maybe uh, the, the most unlikely, uh, because if they don't abandon the agreement, but altogether but uh, you know violate or annul some parts of it that would increase the pressure on the Europeans to to to, uh, to, to respond uh, to perhaps impose sanctions so they face a big decision so to speak the Iranian side essentially to stick with the agreement or to get out of it and 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 and, and uh, abandon it so if you would revisit your options when you were discussing them before, which was a race to the bomb, uh, stay put or move a little bit, a limited move uh, if you're in the light of what I just raised. Okay. Well, as far as you know, the, the whole, what Doug described as the Macron track, I mean, it still runs up against the, the, the basic uh, uh, premise that I mentioned when I was talking about uh, the notion of pressure being enough to get some kind of uh, Unicorn like better deal. Uh, and so far, uh, no one seems to be talking about negotiating even with the Iranians, but, but you know, if this track were to play out, then presumably at some point, uh, the Germans, French, and British, and the EU as a whole would have to be really talking seriously with Iran. But you can go issue by issue, and um, uh, if 
you start looking at things in detail, you see why the Iranians have not made a whole lot of concessions, even under tremendous pressure, and are still unlikely to do so. I mean, the whole missile question. Um, first of all, you know, this is the country that was the target of the War of the Cities, with missiles being rained down on their cities by Saddam Hussein during the extremely destructive Iran-Iraq War. Uh, it is a country that has far weaker air forces in particular, you know, vis-a-vis -vis even just the UAE. And the UAE Air Force could clobber the Iranian Air Force, probably, in terms of just you know, the equipment. Uh, and, and we're not even getting to the Israel side of things, where there's clear, uh, overwhelming technological superiority. So uh, the missiles and the, the Iranian leaders have said repeatedly, you know, 2,000 kilometers is enough for us. For us, you know, we're just talking about deterring and responding to the capabilities of our regional foes. You know, never mind this ICBM business. There's no, no evidence of any uh, work on the Iranian ICBM. All of those are still going to be very important considerations. And short of some broader regional arms control <laughs> regime, which addresses other people's missiles and the Air Forces and everything else, you're just not going to get you know, a concession uh, on that from the Iranians. And as far as the other you know, nefarious malign and destabilizing activity, I've got an article on the issue yeah, yeah. that Zell that, that, uh, has in front of him, which I will incorporate by reference, but you can, you can read that. And you know, whether you're talking about what's going on in Yemen or Syria or Lebanon, I mean, there are very strong reasons why the Iranians are doing what they are doing. Uh, and it's not kill Jews, it's, it's, it's things that have to do with um, how the, the people in Tehran you know, see their security predicament and how they can uh, adjust it to their, try to adjust it to their advantage. Um, so, on, on the first thing, I, I, just, I just don't see the possibility. Now, the second part of your question is L, uh, which is the regime change thing. Um, in your, yeah, the economy has a lot of problems to it, and that's, that's for a number of reasons, some having to do with sanctions, some having to do with domestic mismanagement, and, and a lot of else, uh, other things. But there, Iran is not in a pre-revolutionary or pre-counter-revolutionary situation. A lot of people got real excited with those street demonstrations some weeks ago. Uh, the analogous sort of thing would be people in the United States getting excited about street demonstrations here, and how we had a women's march in Washington, you know, the day after the inauguration that had more people than the inauguration crowd. And to conclude from that, that the United States is in a you know, pre-revolutionary, uh, before regime change situation. <laughs> neither, neither conclusion would be correct. Um, and I think what I said before about the hardliners, including the Supreme Leader, uh, having their position strengthened by being able to say, I told you so, and by saying, and hardliners have said this more privately to journalists and so on, Ah, now we we are we are a better positioned to blame all this problems on the Americans, you know, and not just on uh, the RIGC involvement in the economy and all these other things, which are indeed factors. But in terms of how the blame is attributed, uh, things are going the hardliners' way. And on the final thing about what was it? Uh, oh, um, the sort of partial cheating. When I talked about uh, Iranians um, possibly you know, easing into surpassing the limits in the JCPOA. What I meant was, this would come after a, an Iranian declaration that there's no more JCPOA, the United States reneged on it, we are free from our obligations. But my only point was, that sort of statement would not be followed by you know, ramping up thousands of centrifuges the very next week. So so, so that's that's not a partial cheating, It's that's part of the scenario in which they would say, the deal is dead. Yeah. Uh, like you to, maybe you want to comment, but if you uh, were sitting next to the president, then you have a, an estimate that said that Iran is in a, a pre-revolutionary uh, stage and the prospect of this regime surviving in a uh, and that the more economic pressure would have huge domestic consequences, uh, that the people are disillusioned that they would be uh, which which uh, option would be the smartest uh, to follow uh, if you want to accelerate or to assist or at least not to, uh, to do the change but not to do anything that sort of uh, helps the other way? Would you go to sure. Um, let me ask you first, and I've got a couple of comments. Yeah, Paul said. I'm against regime change in principle. I don't think it works. Uh, now look, we, we, we changed the Nazi regime, we flattened Germany in the process, we changed, we didn't even change the Japanese after the 
at least Latin Japan in the process. Um, I was involved in, in the Iraq regime change, and I, it, I thought all it really did was open the door for the Iranians and, and undermine what was a very successful, at that point, operation in Afghanistan. I was the coordinator for Afghanistan, and I can tell you that in 2003, there weren't any Taliban around. Al Qaeda was on the run, and I didn't mind my son going to do business in Kabul without being surrounded by troops to protect him. And that all went, and by the way, the reason I was coordinator for Afghanistan was because Doug Fight was totally consumed by Iraq. Why the heck was the Comptroller coordinator for Afghanistan? Um, I wasn't in a policy job at that point. I was in a different chain, I was in a business chain. So it tells you something about how we diverted ourselves. And, you know, go, even thinking about regime change in Iran after Mossadegh, you've got to be kidding yourself. I wouldn't want to be within 100 miles of that. You don't know whether regime change will lead to a Republican Guard administration, for example. They're, they're about as religious as, I don't know who, they're not, they're not there for religion. So you get rid of the Ayatollahs and you get the Republican Guard. You've really done well. They're the ones with the guns, and that's another thing that I learned in Iraq. If you leave people with guns, they use them. And so you would have to disarm the Republican Guard. Try it. So my advice to Mr. Trump, which he wouldn't listen to, and I'd never get near him because I signed those national security letters, um, <laughs> would be, Mr. President, don't dig the hole deeper than you're already in. That would be the, my answer on that one. On the issue of, of whether a, a deal could be struck and, and, and the destabilization issue, I don't, I, I do think, I don't agree with what Paul's written um, for a variety of reasons. One, if Iran was simply worried about its security but didn't want to be uh, aggressive, it could support the PLO and not Hamas. It could support Nabi Bari in, in Lebanon and not Hezbollah. Um, you know, and it would stop saying he wants to destroy the Jewish state. The Jewish state doesn't say he wants to destroy the, the uh, Iranian state. So I, I think one has to be careful about that. The article also talks about Israeli, Israel starting four wars. Well, the first one was when five countries invaded a in small Jewish state that was half the size of what it is today. So having said all of that, I don't think Macron is going to try or, or even should try to say, well, you know, Cut back on your destabilizing activities. We made the mistake of giving them their own money, true, but uh, you know, as Rick mentioned, uh, before, you know, before we started, he was at a meeting back in the Reagan years where the decision was made to double cross the Iranians. Well, we've already double crossed them; we could have gone for the money. Um, whether you believe the money helps them or not, whether you believe we should have given them the money or not, that's not part of the JCPOA <coughs> under anybody's uh, terms. So what you really have are three different sets of things that you can negotiate about. You got the sunset provisions, which as I say, I suspect the Iranians could live with a few more years because as I say, their view is very long term. It's kind of like the Chinese. You've got the missiles, you can deal with ranges, maybe not 2,000, maybe 1,000, whatever. If their biggest threat is from Saudi Arabia and, and, uh, uh, and Iraq, and I'm not sure there's a threat from Iraq anymore, I don't know why they need 2,000 clicks. Israelis haven't attacked Iran. But still, that could be discussed. And then the issue of inspections. You've got three different things to negotiate. The ambassadors in this room know that when you've got more than one thing to negotiate, you can find something to reach agreement on. So I come back to my original point. If the United States does not follow up, if Mr. Trump does not follow up on the secondary sanctions, and gives the Europeans wiggle room, then there is something to work on. Obviously, if you impose the secondary sanctions, we're in for a lot of trouble. Thank you. Let's now uh, invite comments, questions. Rick, please. Ambassador Burke. Just a, a, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sort of struck uh, with your proposal, of, uh, in which it isn't your proposal. It's, it's a very popular <coughs> proposal in Washington to 
somehow salvage this agreement by putting more issues on the table. And he said, Ambassador's experience shows you can make deals that way. Well, you, you can put so much on the table that you won't reach a deal. And I'm reminded here of a, really the kind of conceptual breakthrough that was made on the American side in the 1980s when George Shultz and then Ronald Reagan decided let's let's kind of break down the US Soviet relationship into component parts. We can look at arms control, we can look at these regional conflicts, we can look at human rights because we don't like what's going on in the Soviet Union, etc. But we're not going to make all of this dependent on getting solutions to all of these areas. And I think this is exactly what the JCPOA was all about. If you want to talk to the Iranians and get an agreement that deals with their regional behavior and, uh, and, uh, and uh, their, their position in, in the region, if you want to talk about ballistic missiles, uh, you can do that. And that's what the Europeans wanted to, to do. But they didn't say, we'll make that all dependent on getting agreements in those areas in order for the JCPOA. It's not going to work that way. And that was true in our ability to get agreements with the Soviet side. We defined the terms and we stayed within those terms to get an agreement. So I see this as an excuse for not being serious about negotiating when you start putting all of these new issues on the table. Second point, my understanding with what Macron and the Europeans were proposing, and I know the State Department was in close touch with the Europeans for months about this, was not to open up a new negotiation with the Iranians. That was not the proposal. Now, most of the press corps didn't get that fact. But what these were called side agreements, that we were going to unilaterally sort of say things and interpret things and have understandings among ourselves in order to keep the Trump administration in the deal. And even there, despite the efforts by the State Department to get the French, the British, and, and, and the Germans on board, they didn't, in the end, reach an agreement that, they, that the U.S. side felt was enough to take to Trump. So my understanding was when Macron showed up and said, gee, maybe we should talk about these deals and side agreements, Trump had never even been briefed on these uh, negotiations that had been held because for one thing, the Europeans never agreed to extend the sunset provision. And that was seen as a deal killer and even a side agreement here. So, the, so nobody was serious about going back to the Iranians. So I find it strange that here we are now, having walked away from the deal, we're saying, gee, let's go back to the Iranians and see if we can renegotiate it. That's, that's crazy. And secondly, to ask the Europeans to be the middleman while uh, American diplomats are already telling the Europeans, hey, start wind get your com companies to start winding down their operations in Iran is a little bit counterproductive. I don't see the Europeans being willing to, to uh, support a new negotiation on the one hand and then accept secondary uh, sanctions uh, on the other hand. And, and then I guess, I guess finally, I think, uh, while I agree very much with Paul's point and, and some of what Dub said, neither of you really touched what I think is where this is going. And where I think this is going is I don't think the agreement is going to be put together again. Humpty Dumpty has fallen off that wall. I think that inevitably there is going to be the sense that the Iranians, one form or one way or the other, are going to be seen as uh, uh, re-energizing their nuclear program. The Israelis are going to get up in arms, and then Yahoo is going to get boisterous again. And the same kind of rhetoric that in both in Israel and in this town that you heard in 2002 is going to start happening here again. And, and some people in town are going to say the only way to solve this problem, if there isn't a negotiating option, there isn't an agreement that will work here, we need some kind of surgical strike against the Iranians that will take out their nuclear capabilities. And anybody who studied that problem knows that such an option doesn't exist. It would be a massive air attack. It would, it would lead to 
tremendous collateral damage, inevitable retaliation, and then we're 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 in another we're in a war with a country of 80 million people, twice as large as, as Iraq, and whose geography is en enormously difficult to uh, to navigate. And that's where I see uh, there's a high probability of where this ends up. Thank you. Rick, do you want to answer? Yeah, so so quick, uh, very quickly, um, I don't think it's an excuse for not negotiating. As I said, we've had examples before when something collapses. There's an interest in a lot of sides to pick up the pieces. I suspect one of the reasons the State Department didn't raise anything with Mr. Trump was because the Secretary of State at the time had absolutely no dialogue no real ability to talk to Mr. Trump. I think it's a little different today with the new Secretary of State. Uh, I don't know that one has to uh, amend the agreement per se. I think side agreements would be just as good. I don't think there's any connection, as I said, uh, with trying to uh, get the Iranians to do anything in a regional level. I think that's uh, rich much too far. Um, whether uh, you could do something about some of those other areas which are within the framework of the uh, JCPOA, I think that's possible. Um, and secondary sanctions, I agree. I mean, if we impose those, the whole thing is all bets are off. Finally, on a surgical strike, um, I've long believed that it, it's not just a matter of collateral damage. You're talking about a country the size of Texas. You're talking about a lot of bases. Frankly, the only way we could knock everything out of Iran is pull everything out of everywhere else in the world. And then we better have good battle damage assessment to know that we've done it. We have crappy battle damage assessment, which means that we won't know if we actually knocked everything out, which means we'll have to send everything back a second time. Um, militarily, this thing ain't, ain't a start. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, can, yeah. You, can you clarify one thing? I can clarify whatever you think. You keep saying Trump shouldn't reimpose secondary sanctions. But if I'm correct, he has reimposed secondary sanctions. You're saying don't enforce them, he's, he's, right? He has said I'm reimposing them, and now I'm going to implement them. And if you remember, they, you have 90 days for some companies, 180 days for others. Those are no, no, those are, those those are wind downs. downs. Right. Those right. are wind downs. So the question then becomes, how quickly do you implement? And he can you extend and that. Can, you can extend it, and you can stall. But the, just to be clear, those are periods of time for people that already have business there to pull their business out. New contracts are not allowed. This is what Bolton was saying. Right. And so what you're saying is he he just shouldn't start punishing companies for doing business in Iran right. anytime or soon. dragging their heels and not yeah, right. making investment in Iran and they think the next six Well, right now, it's an issue of, of protecting the investment. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Please. Uh, Wayne Mary, the, yes, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Thank you to the panel. I'd like the panelists to comment on the proposition that what the president has done is, in effect, to fulfill an ex existing pledge by the Congress. Because when the JCPOA was being negotiated, a large number of members of Congress sent a public letter to Iran saying, anything you sign with this President of the United States will not outlive his administration. And I've heard very little in the public commentary on what the President has done about the mutual responsibility at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and what that means for the ability of the United States of America to do a deal not just with Iran, but with Sao Tome on anything uh, if you do not get it in the form of a treaty, and we all know you can't get anything in the form of a treaty because you can't get two-thirds of the Senate. So how does the United States do business with anybody when we have demonstrated the ability of the Congress to sabotage a major international agreement preemptively, and then the next president simply does what the Congress has already said what he would do? I think we've got a pretty long history of international agreements and understandings in which the United States has participated to take forms other than uh, the Senate ratifiable treaty. And, and I think the art form uh, is, is less important in, in assessing the importance of the agreement itself. Yes, we all understand you know, one of the reasons why the Obama administration took the path it did, uh, as reflected in that, that incredible letter 
the Tom Cotton uh, organized, um, it, it, you never would have gotten two thirds in the Senate. But as also reflected by how many people now, including some in this room, said, well, I thought it was a bad deal, but now that we've got it, I think you know, we should have st stuck with it. Uh, there's something to be said for executive branch initiative, you know, in the face of you know, congressional resistance of that kind, they can still do some good and still, in the longer term, um, be, be in the national interest. And I, I, I would say the JCPOA uh, fits, fits that uh, uh, description. Let me so let me just say, as one of the people in the room who feels it was a bad deal and thinks we shouldn't have left it, um, I would also say this, that's what leadership's all about. If Mr. Roosevelt, in 1940, would have listened to his Congress, it wouldn't have been lend lease, and we probably would have let the British go under before the Japanese attacked us. This side, please. Yes. Oh, sir. Please. I'm Tatsuni. I want to ask a bigger question for a moment, and that is, what is the United States' position toward Iran's expansion in the Middle East? So, uh, as Iran openly says, we are in control in Lebanon. We are doing better in Damascus, increasing our war in Iraq, and even with a little investment in Yemen, we are doing quite well. And the United States is basically seen as retreating from the Middle East. And so the question is, where do we go from here? And logically, you have only three possibilities. You can either continue to withdraw, or you can go into four or five proxy wars. In none of them, they're doing well. Or you have to deal with Iran. Now, if you for a moment consider the third option, uh, we hear it's a big country, uh, we can never find all this stuff. Well, first of all, Paul mentioned earlier how much they suffered during the war with Iraq. I was the guest that decided that I'm an Italian-American to disregard my Israeli background. And uh, their lesson from the suffering is that they never want a war again. They, I, I never seen a people who anti war. Then the, and the best proof to it is what happened in May 2003. When we overthrew uh, the Iraqi military, Iran said everything on the table. And when the State Department rejected it and the guard and one or the other regime changed, the army still continued for two years not to push the program. So there's enough for us to change to stay their next on the line for them to come to the table. So the notion that last, we have this cliche which is like a, a conversation stopper, including in the New York Times yesterday. We can't stand another land war. We lost the land wars. As Don mentioned, we, we won the land wars in, in three weeks in Afghanistan. We won the land wars in Iraq in three weeks. We lost the nation-building projects. The, the billions of dollars and their sacrifices went not into defeating these countries, which was easy. We can defeat Iran just as easily. Uh, it, if we intend them to stay and make them a democracy, that's where we're going to lose. So in short, I want to hear not about this or that agreement, but what is the United States foreign policy going to be on Iran expansionism in the uh, Middle East with the Sunni camp being so weak that the, uh, to close here, the Saudi military is good for parades but nothing else? Thank you. Okay. Uh, look, you want to fight a war with Iran? That's fine, but then what are you going to do? You cannot separate what happens after phase four with what happens before phase four. That's what the Iraq problem was all about. Are we gonna reconstruct Iran? And will the Iran that is left after we send troops in there, assuming that the Iranians will just fall over and what was the phrase they were gonna throw rose petals at us or something? Uh, a cakewalk. A cakewalk, right. And a slam and dunk. With that. And a slam dunk and all these other wonderful phrases. Then what happens? The odds are we will have an even more hostile Iran, if that's possible, than we have today. That's number one. Number two is what can the administration do? For a start, stop talking about withdrawal. Stop. Don't pull troops out of Syria, for example. Don't pull troops out of Iraq. Part of the reason that, we, that the Iranians are doing so well is because we've created the vacuums for them to fill. Now we're having belly aches over it. 
Mr. Trump, at one and the same time, wants the Iranians to go back into their little boxes and at the same time wants us to pull out of our troops out of the region and expects everybody to applaud. It doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just would like to make some remarks and maybe to, to let you know about the Russian position on this issue. Uh, first, of course, we are deeply disappointed by the United States President Donald Trump's decision to unilaterally give up commitment to implement the G GCPOA. Uh, the second, uh, this Iranian deal is a key multilateral agreement approved by uh, UN Security Council resolution. And uh, frankly, uh, you said that I would like to say that each uh, agreement, arrangement, deal has some disadvantages. It's impossible to create something ideal. For example, we have with the United States START Treaty. If you ask me whether we are satisfied with this treaty, I will say, no, we are not satisfied. I would like to get more uh, during the negotiations with the United States. And if you ask my counterparts, for example, Ellen Tauscher, or uh, my colleagues from uh, the Department of Defense, they will say, no, we would like to get more. But it's, it is a real compromise. So I just would like to draw your attention to the title of this uh, Iranian deal. It's about nuclear issues. We have, with my American colleagues, a problem, a problem of strengthening NPT. Uh, if you ask me whether you're satisfied with NPT, of course, there is a lot of loopholes in NPT. And one of these uh, loopholes is a problem of enrichment capability. Nobody keeps uh, a possibility for any member of NPT to develop enrichment capability. Why country X has to stop to develop enrichment capability? So the same situation with uh, Iran. Why Iran has to stop to develop enrichment capability? Because Washington does not want it, or uh, whether Moscow does not want it. Uh, you see that, as to me, I, uh, you know me that I'm a civic uh, diplomat, and I would like to say that I would like to be with the United States, and I would like, with due respect to my Swiss colleague, you see that to, uh, to limit a uh, number of countries uh, who possess enrichment capabilities. Because uh, I don't want to develop this idea, but for me it's clear. And it's a lack of our negotiation process with the United States in this regard. As two missiles, of course I want nobody uh, possess uh, missile capability. I can survive with the missile capability of the United States. What can I do? But of course, I don't want uh, to see more countries with such capabilities. But we have to recognize that there is no any agreement, there is no any arrangement that could limit any country to develop missile capabilities. It's our problem, it's problem of the United States as well as the Russian Federation. There is a legitimate question why Iran has to limit its capabilities. Behavior in the region. I have some concerns regarding the position of uh, Iran on the various issues in this region. I would like to see another uh, foreign policy of Iran in this region, but what can I do at this stage? I just came to try to persuade. Uh, I don't trust, personally, I don't trust that it's possible to reach um, a general agreement with Iran on various issues. I agree with uh, those uh, diplomats, uh, with those uh, specialists who consider it is very important uh, to, uh, to keep this uh, deal alive and to try to solve outstanding issues in other format. It seems to me that, please, I would like you to understand me, I don't want to interfere in your internal relations. I don't want to criticize uh, administration, that I don't want to be blamed, you see that. I don't want to become a toxic ambassador. It's for the record, first of all. <laughs> then I would like to consider that it seems to me that sometimes uh, administration uh, decides to take some bad experience from the Soviet Union. If you remember the slogan of the Soviet Union, first we destroy, the second, we create. 
what we see now. First, let's destroy Iranian deal and then let's create something special. What does it mean something special? It's not clear at all. Who will start such negotiations? Why United, why Iranian uh, side decides to start such negotiations? Why Iran uh, decides to make some limits uh, on their behavior, so-called behavior, on missile capabilities, on nuclear um, uh, activities? As to me, as to Russian side, you see that we are satisfied what Iran is doing with IAEA. We have raised a lot of questions to uh, Secretary General of IAEA. What kind of problems they face? And answer is, everything is fine. There is no uh, uh, any violation regarding the Iranian deal. So why should we um, undercut such activities? Uh, such we, uh, we don't understand. But for me, for a Russian diplomat, I have some questions in my mind, not to you, not to my partners, not to my colleagues, but to myself. How could I trust the United States administration if today United States decides to make an agreement with somebody and next day United States can withdraw from this agreement? How could I trust on potential uh, negotiations with the United States on INF on expansion of uh, STAR treaty, on open sky treaty, on CFE. So I see, you see that, uh, taken from this experience, that there is a lot of unpredictability in the behavior of uh, my distinguished partners from this administration. So you see that uh, you mentioned about the secondary uh, sanctions. Maybe you're right, maybe not. Let's wait for a while, let's see what will be in the future. But if you ask me uh, whether you trust um, about the possibility to, to see this uh, deal alive, I will say no. You see that we have UN security res resolution. How it is possible to see it alive without one uh, vote from permanent member of Security Council? Whether this resolution is valid or not, my answer, maybe you will uh, correct me, but it's uh, not a life at all, you see that. Moreover, you see that the United States uh, uh, decides to start uh, negotiations with Iran. What's about uh, Western uh, uh, parties? They will participate in these negotiations or not? By the way, what's about China? What about Russia? You say that I can't see any uh, proposal from administration uh, to involve Russia into these negotiations. But we have our own uh, relations, economical and political relations. Moreover, you say that we have uh, some influence on uh, Iranian uh, government. Uh, I consider that we could be uh, useful uh, to try to get uh, some results uh, during the potential uh, negotiations. So there are some remarks that I would Thank like to share with you. I want to remind everyone that uh, countries have got a number of uh, agreements and CPT negotiations over the part of the ABM treaty. What I'm just saying, and other countries have got a number of agreements. This wasn't even a treaty. Uh, so, uh, we'll yes, sir. I'm uh, Arshad Mohammed of Reuters. I have one question for Mr. Zakheim and one for Mr. Pilar. Yeah. Mr. Zakheim, you talked about the possibility, as the ambassador just alluded to, of if the secondary sanctions aren't imposed and entering into some kind of negotiation whereby the Iranians would accept greater uh, restrictions vis-a-vis -vis sunsets, missiles, etc. Uh, inspections. One, um, how do you envisage that coming to pass? Would that be a direct U.S.-Iranian negotiation or with the Europeans who have, as you pointed out, just failed to reach agreement on that on that very point? Second, related to that, you know, nobody gives up anything for nothing. What would you offer the Iranians in such a circumstance, particularly when you've just broken your word? And then, Mr. Pilar, um, can you give us your assessment of the probabilities that Iran may, over time, choose to respond 
uh, to the current administration's um, ab abandonment of the JCPOA by uh, increasing, for example, um, uh, terrorist attacks on U.S. or U.S. allies or Jewish targets or uh, and similarly, what, if at all, do you think are the odds that their uh, regional activities in the four countries we all know uh, may become even more uh, aggressive? Uh, in other words, do you see the possibility of ancillary sort of collateral damage uh, as a result of this? Thank you. Uh, Andrew Steinfeld, retired Foreign Service Officer. Um, just a few points. Um, I think if one thinks about why this agreement was broken, I think it makes absolute sense. Uh, uh, Richard Grinnell's first tweet in Germany makes absolute sense because my, my view is the following. The, the abrogation of the agreement had nothing or very little to do with the agreement per se. It had to do with a consensus in Jerusalem, Riyadh, and Washington to cut Iran down to size in the region. Um, if you look carefully at the Saudi press release, the Saudi press release begins by saying, we actually were in favor, or we agreed with, the JCPOA. However, it didn't result in what we wanted it to result in. So what it resulted in was an ever more powerful Iran in the region, more money flowing into Iran, more normalization of Iran in the international community, and therefore I think a consensual agreement was taken between Jerusalem, Riyadh, and the United States that with the agreement intact, you could not cut Iran down to size, which argues for secondary sanctions. And just to finish, I would like to say, and maybe my, our Swiss colleague can say something, I think there is a complete difference of view in Europe on Iran than there is in Washington, Riyadh, and Jerusalem. Look at the President's comments. He called, in his public statement, he called them a rotten, decaying regime. And he, in the next paragraph, he all but called for regime change. The long-suffering people in Iran. Um, that's a language you would never get from Paris or Berlin. Thank you. Please, now, comment on the All right. Um, here's the problem. We've already walked away. You know, Mr. Ambassador, all the arguments you made would have been great two weeks ago. We are where we are. So then the question is, what do you want to do about it? I don't believe that we should just wring our hands and say this whole thing is lost. I don't know that any good comes out of that. I don't think any good comes out of secondary sanctions. I don't think any good comes out of um, threatening NATO in any w which way, which I think is a problem. Uh, and frankly, uh, if Russia wants to be helpful, my attitude would be, absolutely, why not? Now, what would we give Iran? One thing I would give Iran is an unconditional guarantee that the president just gave to Kim Jong-un. We're not going to mess with regime change. We're not going to listen to those who say that. I think it's very important. Maybe even get a congressional resolution to that effect. I happen to think that, as I said, regime change never works out the way we want it to. So what's the point? Andrew, um, do you honestly think that getting rid of this agreement is going to cut the Iranians down to size? I think that's not. That's what the White House thinks, not what I think. Well, the White House doesn't think, so let's start with that. <laughs> and as for, as for, and as, for, as, for, as for normalization, I don't see anybody other than the United States, Israel, and the GCC not having relationships with Iran. Everybody else seems to manage. Everybody else is doing business or trying to. I don't know that what we've just tried to do is going to make Iran any more of a pariah than it was before, which it wasn't really very much of. What it will do, as I say, we're essentially shooting ourselves in the foot, and I don't know that we have, at least the administration has fully recognized that. I think people in the State Department have, and maybe they can convince Mr. Pompeo. Mr. Mattis clearly understands that. And that's another point. The Secretary of Defense of this country clearly was not in favor of abrogating the agreement. I'm sure he cares every bit about 
American security as the president does. Yeah, I think part of the administration <laughs> wants to. <laughs> I think part of the administration wants to starve Iran into submission. It ain't going to work. No, I didn't make the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -oh. Um, you know, any comments about cutting Iran down to size? I mean, just underscores how much of the declared opposition and debate in this country to the JCPOA has been, to be quite blunt, phony, exactly. and and has has been uh, not really about the terms of the agreement, but wanting to keep Iran as a pariah and isolated and punished uh, for a long exactly. time. Uh, with regard to the question of uh, regional. Activity and this really also responds somewhat to what we didn't respond to fully before, which was Amitai's question about dealing with um, Iranian influence in the region. Iran it does what it does in the region for very specific, country specific, situation specific reasons, um, such as you know its equities in Syria, the, the really the only area country alliance that's had for years. That's why it's invested so heavily in Syria. I think we've we've tended to believe, start to believe our own rhetoric that Iran is doing nefarious mind destabilizing things because it's got some grand scheme and grand uh, objective to just be disruptive or kill people not like them or something else. No. Um, it, they, they are responding to specific situations with specific security interests in mind, which implies that the life or death of the JCPOA itself is not, in my view, going to make a lot of difference one way or the other. Now, one should point out, and here was some more of the rhetoric that's been used by many in attacking the JCPOA. Oh, well, this is you know, this is emboldened Iran to do to be more aggressive regionally. They've got you know this 150 billion dollars, and that's being used for terrorism and so on and so forth. Well, if that were true, then we ought to see, with the uh, Trump administration's reneging on the agreement, Iranian regional behavior getting better. I do not predict that, but I don't predict also that it's going to get you know a whole lot worse. And, and the kinds of things that you mentioned. They just won't have a reason to do that, and they will be deterred for the same reasons they've been deterred from doing other nasty things we can envision. And I think, you know, uh, more along the lines of Amitai's question, uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by the news, you know, today out of out of Iraq, where we, they just had an election, and uh, Muqtad al-Sadr, the head of who was one of our real bad guys for years and years, was the head of the victorious, or, or the, at least the plurality winning electoral coalition, and he's certainly less our guy than Abadi is. Well, um, let's not look at this situation as if it were part of some grand scoreboard, the way we used to look at the U.S.-Soviet Cold War, where you know every little bit of influence you had is, is a loss for us. And it went. For us to think of the U.S. and the Iran in those terms is quite frankly an insult to the United States, because Iran is a third-rate power in, in and we, we're not part of some grand scoreboard like that. We should look at a situation like Iraq and say, okay, we, how exactly do our interests in the Iranians differ? And how might they be parallel? And Muqtada al-Sadr is saying some things like, uh, uh, maybe you know, the U.S. troops should stay there for a while, right? so we can finish off Islamic State and so on. And he's been starting to be more, more critical of Iran in certain ways. So it's, it's not a simple us versus them kind of thing. Um, and let me stop there. Okay, thank, and thank you. I've got right. a bunch of uh, people who have raised their hands. So Jacob, you, and then these two ladies here, and then we'll finish with our distinguished leader. If that's okay. Or you want to go first? Okay. Please, Jacob. Jacob, however, in national interest. Yeah. I was a little worried there because both Paul and Dove actually were, I think, being overly timorous in analyzing the Trump administration. And we, we sort of segued toward it. But I think bluntly put, Rick Burt is right. And Jacob? <laughs> Dove, you can you declare that the... <laughs> well, I had to make a careful calculation. Of, uh, uh, but Dove, uh, you, can, you can say that the administration is not thinking about foreign policy, but the fact is that they are. You may not like it, but if you look at 
for example, a piece in the Wall Street Journal today by Walter Russell Mead, which I think is channeling John Bolton's thinking. It's very plain. They are headed on the path toward war with Iran, and the reason is set in a broader strategic framework, which is that Obama is seen as having presided over a would-be post-American moment. Trump is going to create a neo-American moment, a golden age of American power, in which the United States, as it periodically does, takes out an enemy to show that it can do it. So why couldn't Trump, together, as you know, Mr. Netanyahu is quite eager to attack Iran with America as an ally, why not go bomb it? Doesn't have to be a massive assault and declare victory, whether it's a victory or not. Yeah, not to, all, all of the sanctions that were put on. I'm sorry, Kelly Tor Kelly Jane Torrance, uh, the Weekly Standard. Uh, all of the sanctions that were put on Iran before the JCPOA, those were not all because of Iran's nuclear program. Uh, it was, there were human rights abuses. Um, sponsor of terrorism, all of these things. And I, I'm curious, I have not heard anyone make a, um, I don't mean here today, I mean in general, make a good argument as to why we should ignore all of those things uh, in pursuit of an agreement on nuclear weapons. I Obviously, you know, we don't want Iran to, to have nuclear weapons, but the pursuit of nuclear weapons is not by far the worst thing that Iran does. And I, I just wanted to note, um, um, uh, Mr. Pilar, you, you, you commented that, you know, people pointed to the protests and wonder if the regime is fragile. Well, look at the march on Washington by women here. I'm just sure the key difference is that the people protesting here in America are not risking their lives every time they go out on the streets to protest. It's only people in Charlottesville. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let me get one more here, and then you can then and I think this sort of actually follows up on your question. My understanding, just for the record, is that the non-nuclear sanctions that the U.S. has had on Iran for many years remain there and were never lifted off. Right, right. Um, but you guys can clarify that. That's correct. Yeah, but, but let me, my question is this. Um, you know, Trump's main complaint, or one of his complaints about the JCPOA was that it was only about the nuclear deal. It wasn't comprehensive enough. It didn't include Syria. It didn't include Yemen, which only really happened like two months before the deal was together. But... But my question is, does that mean then that we can logically conclude that if he tries to strike a deal with North Korea, that it's also going to be a comprehensive grand bargain sort of a deal? Can they actually accomplish that? And are you struck by some of the rhetoric that's been coming out from this administration recently um, about how Kim has been so great and very honorable and maybe we can help him electrify his rural areas uh, in exchange for getting rid of his nuclear program? Thank you. Okay, um, on Jacob's point, yes, they, they are thinking. They are not thinking about second and third order consequences, which is really what Iraq was about. Yet, you want to have a limited strike, fine. That guarantees that the Iranians go full bore for nuclear capability. It guarantees that the Iranians will make even more mayhem in the Middle East. It guarantees you'll never get a deal with them on anything. Um, our problem at least right now, is that yes, we, we think of what's there up front. We've always had a problem thinking about second and third order consequences. Look, look at the consequences of, of Mossadegh. It took 26 years. These things don't just stop. This is not the good 26 years. This is not the a good 26 years, and now we've had a bad 26 years. It's kind of difficult, you know? Right? Instead of seven and seven, we have 26 and 26. I mean, the point is, these are not novels or movies where you have the end. There isn't the end. Now remember swinging Tehran in the right. 70s. That's, so that's my answer to you. Second and third order consequences. Uh, why ignore human rights? It's not a matter of ignoring human rights. It's a matter of, and, and here I totally agree with Rick, how, how wide a scope do you want to have? You, if you have a wide enough scope, you go nowhere. By the way, until the, the new crown prince showed up, I think we didn't exactly focus on human rights in Saudi Arabia either. 
so, and we've dealt with China, and we don't exactly focus on human rights there. And even when we do, it's not as broad as some people would like. And finally, um, a grand bargain, I would say, yeah, I think that's exactly where Mr. Trump is going. He wants to have a grand bargain, and my fear is part of that grand bargain is going to be pulling troops out of Korea, which he will then wave a white paper and say, we have peace in our time, and then God help us. Thank you. Um, Jacob, I'm worried about exactly the same things you were worried about, and secondly, some one of the things Dove said, the sort of bloody nose strike uh, would be uh, more likely than anything else to um, uh, sway the balance of opinion in decision-making circles in, in Tehran in favor of let's go for a nuclear weapon. Uh, and I would recall as a bit of previous Middle East experience uh, when we had the Israeli strike on the OSIRAC reactor in Iraq, at the time that strike uh, took place, the um, Iraqi program, which was based on a plutonium route, was kind of slow and almost semi-morbid. The Iraqi reaction was to speed it up greatly, make it more secret, and go to the Iranian route. And that's you know, the, the bad surprise we got after, uh, after Operation Desert Storm. On the whole question, which gets into the North Korean part, about broader agendas versus you know, grand bargains versus uh, narrow agendas, a couple of points. One, as far as Iran is concerned, you know, the, the people who were really involved in negotiating the JCPOA under the Obama administration were firmly convinced, and evidently their Iranian colleagues were convinced as well, that it would have been impossible to get any agreement at all, in that case, by a broader agenda. Bearing in mind that not only do we have all these other complaints against Iran missiles and so on, but Iran has gripes against us. And they would naturally and quite justifiably dump their other things on the table as well. And we would have had this horrible mess of an agenda and nothing would have come out of it. Now on North Korea, I, you know, I think we got to remember the, although indeed there are some transferable lessons and, and the North Koreans have certainly uh, taken lessons explicitly about like the Libya experience that Doug mentioned earlier. And that as a reason of saying, we're not going to make an obvious mistake. Uh, we're going to you know, hang on to our nukes, which is one of the reasons to be pessimistic about the outcome. Um, I hope, like everyone else, that, that the president can achieve something there. And if he does, I'll support his Nobel Prize. Uh, but let's also bear in mind things that are different in terms of uh, Iran and North Korea. Iran has an arsenal of nuclear weapons. Yeah, Iran right. doesn't. I'm serious. North Korea has an, Iran, has an arsenal of nuclear weapons. Iran does not and never has it. Um, the regimes are very different. And we have a, 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 a thugocracy in North Korea that um, uh, is, is fragile in many ways that the Iranian system is not, uh, you know, despite street demonstrations. Um, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the street demonstrations in North Korea. <laughs> uh, and I, I think in the North Korean case, if there's any hope for Mr. Trump to get get to the Nobel stage, it probably would be with a broader regime, because uh, denuclearization just doesn't seem feasible given what it what the, the nuclear deterrent does for the Kim regime without a much greater change in the whole situation. But we're talking about. Uh, yes, we, you know, U.S. troops on the peninsula are part of this, you know, formal peace treaty ended in the war. I mean, this is really big stuff. I don't know if the administration, how seriously you know, they're starting to plan on these things at all, but I think that would be necessary. Iran is a totally different situation. You know, they do not have a nuclear deterrent. Um, and so they made that calculation, which I mentioned at the very outset of my opening remarks, in terms of the relative pros and cons of getting out from pariahood versus whatever a nuke would do for them. And they decided the first was better than the second. So there are important respects, even though indeed there's a, there are a lot of transferable lessons being made by the various regimes, in which these two situations are quite different. Thank you. A lot of questions you can uh, I, uh, I think I agree with Dolph uh, that the story is still being written. And the how it ends will determine our judgment about what the president have done. Uh, some of us, uh, you in particular, though, uh, and me, we have experience with Mr. Trump in a very different context. Uh, he starts very big. He may be very tough. He makes uh, statements which may sound outrageous. 
and then he comes back to his senses. And you judge him not by the beginning story, but by the conclusion. I have to tell you that on a personal level, I like to have uh, a president of the United States who promised something during his campaign and seems to be doing exactly that. Uh, uh, mind you, uh, we talked a lot about uh, John Bolton, but if uh, uh, Mr. Flynn uh, would stay as national security advisor, he would be facing tougher in Iran. And his book with Michael Adin, if anything, would be Islamophobic. I could not say anything uh, like that about Mr. Bolton. Uh, I understand that the Europeans are upset. Well, because they have important interests and they want their concerns to be taken into account. They cannot insist that as a matter of principle, they always should have a veto power. Uh, they uh, felt that they could impose sanctions on Russia, uh, including unilaterally, without UN Security Council, because Russia was perceived as a threat in Europe, particularly because of Ukraine. Well, you know, it so happens that, uh, as Dov said, to the Israelis and to the Saudis, Iran looks more like an uh, apocalyptic threat than Russia looks uh, to the British or, or the French, right? And since we quite justly consider the Israelis and the Saudis as important allies, we should take their concerns into account. Uh, and uh, the Iranians, if anything, are more assertive in their region uh, than Russia is in Europe. And that brings me to a final point. If we would end up with a major war against Iran, uh, I think that both uh, Dole and Paul were absolutely right. It could uh, lead to very detrimental geopolitical and economic consequences. I don't know whether Ambassador Antonov would agree that if uh, uh, oil would go uh, to two or three hundred uh, uh, dollars a barrel. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you made it <laughs> <laughs> on the other hand, yeah. on the other hand, if the president would do what we hope would do, what Dov have formulated, uh, I think, uh, very clearly, uh, uh, to uh, threaten the Europeans with secondary sa sanctions, but to know when to stop and to use uh, common pressure to get a better deal from the Iranians, and it doesn't need to be a comprehensive agreement. It can be done in a whole variety of ways. If all this happens, I don't know whether Mr. Trump would deserve a Nobel Peace Prize after Ledek Tchoe and Arafat receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm not sure how much we should be impressed with that. But let's be open-minded uh, how it is going to end. It may end terrible, and it still may end great. Thank you. So, good point. Do you want to make any conclusion? The only thing I would say is that uh, I can understand why the ambassador has thumbs up at 300 bucks a barrel. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, you would agree with me, Mr. Ambassador, that if you only got $100 a barrel in some agreement with Iran, that wouldn't be too bad. <laughs> uh, just the, the one concluding point I want to underscore was the credibility issue and, and how that plays into how Iran, uh, Iran officials see things right now and what the political risks would be for any Iranian leader of any ideological strike who starts talking about, well, let's reach a new deal with the United States. Um, it's it's going to be greeted sort of like we talk about a piece of these days. You're going to make a new deal with this administration that just totally reneged after we made all these commitments and kept it and so on. Uh, that's, I think, the main reason why much of what's been talked about in terms of you know, getting something better or new which simply isn't in the cards after what happened last year. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Doug. Thank you to all of you. And uh, that's the end of our discussion. Thank you very much.